We are in a series called Redefining Faith. Do you know you have faith? You have faith. The Bible says God has dealt to every man and woman the measure of faith. How much is it? I don't know. It's a measure. What I found about Jesus is that when he gives something to us, he expects something in return with what he gave us. It's called stewardship. And that's true in all areas, you know. I mean, he, he gives you a marriage. He gives you your singlehood. He gives you character. He gives you integrity. He gives you relationships. He gives you a faith. He gives you a prayer life. He gives you a word. He gives you a thing, and then he says, I want you to do something with it. I want you to multiply it. I want you to develop it. I want you to increase it. And I want you to give it back to me, and then let me re rework it yet again. You know, we're in this series called Redefining Faith. The more I think about it, the more, you know, I think about, you know, how many times in scriptures, over 200 times, faith is used. And I think about this one verse in Hebrews, we'll get to Hebrews in a while, but uh, in, in Hebrews it says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. I, I love that, that there's models and mentors, there's seasoned people all around us, and we're to follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. We're, we're to imitate, and we, and we do that in Hebrews. We do that in real life. I look at I look at Pat here on the front row, and you know this vibrant young lady of 86. She said I could say how old she was, and I've learned a long time ago you never say how old a woman is. But I asked permission. She said, Yeah, no problem. She, she's worshiping. She's jumping up and down, and I'm thinking, you know what? That's who I want to follow. When I'm 86, I want to be there. I want to be in that front row. Not a lot of airtime, but you know what? Just I'm, I'm doing something. Not you know the vertical leap is, is kind of gone, but you know what? We got some air under there, you know. I think I, that's what I want to be like that. Do you want to be like that? Or do you want to be just kind of, you know, slumping around, you know, watching TV with the channel changer? I don't want that. No, I want to follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promises of God. That, that is my lot in life. That is your lot in life. Faith is your lot in life. And so we're talking about this redefining faith. I'm really excited about faith. I really am. And let's get to a hard one, though. Luke 22. I want you to see this verse. We're going to go to Hebrews because we're talking... Um, through some of the great characters in, they call it the Hall of Faith. And these are people, men and women, that believe God for great things, for big things. These were people of stature. And so we're, we're, we, we've been gleaning over a few weeks, you know, what this looks like and who these people were. Talk a little bit about Moses today, but before we get there, I want to I wanna look at the words of Jesus in Luke 22, verse 31. I mean, these, these, I mean these, are, these are intense words right here. Simon, Simon, or Peter. Behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That verse is in, in theological circles is called a warm, fuzzy verse. Now imagine, now imagine Peter for a moment. Imagine Peter for a moment. Jesus comes says, follow me. Peter immediately drops his net, walks away from his fishing business, his livelihood, and follows who he believes is the Son of God. Believes, okay? Now think about that. And now Jesus comes and says, Peter, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat. That's intense. I mean, you can imagine what's going on in somebody's mind right there. Wait a minute, I, one day I'm fishing. I'm doing quite nicely. I'm doing fine. I got my little life ca carved out. I'm catching fish. I'm making money. I leave that to follow him. And now he's telling me, it's not the school bully that's after me. Satan has demanded me? That's a whole new, that's a whole nother low. We're not talking to school bully. Satan has demanded you. And he wants to sift you like wheat. What are you thinking? If you're Peter, can I have another verse, please? Can I have another word? Give me another promise. De Satan has demanded that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you. Okay, right there. If Jesus is praying for you, it's all going to be good. Right? He ever lives to make intercession for the saints according to the word of God. Jesus is praying for you right now. That's why your faith is not going to fail. It may falter. I mean, how many of you have had a faith collapse or 10 or 20 in your life. You know, where you're just trusting God, you're worshiping God, you believe God, you're highlighting verses in the Bible. Yeah, that's me. You get a t-shirt. You know, it's all good. And all of a sudden, man, a trial comes along. Bam! There's a sifting going on. And it hurts. And then all of a sudden you go, how did I go from mountaintop faith 
to now I'm in the valley of despair. And how did it happen so quickly? Because there's a sifter out there, Satan, and he's looking to sift. And I will say this: this isn't this isn't this isn't a one and done for Peter. This isn't, you know, oh yeah, Satan's going to come one time, man. Just buck up, stay strong, survive it, it'll get better. No, 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 no. This is the start of his sifting. <laughs> All of us are going to go through many siftings by the end of our life. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's true. You're going to get sifting. You're thinking, well, what's the, what's the point of that? Glad you didn't ask, but I'm going to tell you. The point of sifting, the point of sifting is to crush you. Give me another promise. Yeah, it's to break you. It's to separate you. Now, from the devil's perspective, it's to separate you from the confidence and faith that you have in God. From God's perspective, it's to bring you to the end of yourself. So that you might have a greater reliance on God. See, it doesn't matter who's, who's doing the sifting, if it's Satan or if God's allowing it. That's not even the point. The point is what comes forth after the sifting. The point is, what does my lo life look like when I'm at the end? When I'm, when I'm at the end of myself. And I'll just say this, this whole thing, um, this ascent into the kingdom, if you will, uh, this progression of faith, this working out our salvation, you know, it, it's not in a straight line, man. It, it's up, it's down, it's forward, it's backwards. But God is going to have his way because he's praying for us. And you may falter, and I may falter, and I will falter. But my faith is not going to fail at the end. It's going to be tried, and it's going to come forth like gold. It is. That's, that's because of God. It's not because of me. This isn't, you know, this faith isn't like, I'm going to try to believe harder. No, it's cooperating with God, what he wants to do, and who he is. What's the character, and what's the nature of God? See, the sifting gets easier as you know his character more. That's, that's the whole deal. Why is time in the Word, you know, reading? Listening, listening to good sermons, not bad sermons, listening to good sermons. Um, you know, what's the point of that? The point is that you would grasp the character and nature of Jesus because ultimately the definition of faith is the state of believing on the basis of the reliability of the one trusted. It's trust, it's confidence, and faith. So once again, this isn't just faith for faith's sake. This is, I'm walking with Jesus, I'm learning about Jesus, I'm seeing what he does in, in given situations, and then I believe based on who he says he is, and what he does in my life, and the examples of those around me. And then, I mean, the end game is that we believe more and more, not less and less. And what you see in the Gospels is, is Jesus really is encouraging us to increase our faith, to believe for more, not less. Bigger, not smaller. But there's a sifting that has to take place. And there's an end that comes to it. Now, this, this is, the, this is the, uh, you know, the fulfilling thing about missions and the frustrating thing about missions. Is that you always find yourself in places and with people where right off the bat you come to an early conclusion. You don't have the resources. There's not enough resources. There just isn't. And name the country. It doesn't matter what the country is. You will always find yourself in a place where you're going, I don't know what to do. And there's a whisper from heaven. That's the point. You don't know what to do. I do. I don't have enough. You're right. You don't. I do. And, and everywhere, there's a different version of it in every country. But it's the same thing. I'm at the end. I got nothing. But I have you. I have what you've done in my life. I have who you are, Jesus. And I have who you want to be to these people. And, and we're going to start there. See, when we get to Greece, you know, there is, uh, like I said, there's fifty to 100,000 refugees there. Now, the irony of that is you have a bankrupt government saying, yeah, come on over, we'll help you. And then when they get there, they don't have anything. And so the, these friends of mine that are working with refugees in this one abandoned building, it's an abandoned building, and they have nothing. Everybody's saying nothing. 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 So when you say nothing, what do you mean? Nothing. There's nothing. So I was talking to my friends. I said, so, I mean, do they have something to sleep on? No. Do they have a change of clothes? No. Do they have, like, toiletries? No. Do they have, like, toothbrushes and toothpaste? No. Do, uh, do they have any coats? No. Do they have a blanket? No. Well, what do they have? Nothing. I said, oh, okay. We'll come over and we'll help. What do you bring? Ah, we got, you know, a few people donated. We got a few thousand bucks. We're gonna, hopefully going to get them. They said, really? Food. <laughs> 
food. So we're going to go over there, assess. I'll be posting on Facebook um, and just showing you what's up. But, you know, there is going to be, a, I, I guarantee there's going to be another one of those moments like, man, what do you do here? Now, let me just say, option A is go home and do nothing and change the channels or, or live like that or allow ourselves to be troubled at a deep level. See, faith isn't about comfort and ease. It's about what troubles God? What troubles me? Is my heart in sync with him? And what do I do about it? What are you going to do? I don't know. I couldn't even tell you what I'm going to do. But I will let you know, and I do know this, that God will do something. Because there's just something about, go through scriptures, man. I mean, Genesis all the way through, and you will see, everybody comes to the end of themselves. And then after that, you say, God, what now? But we're going to believe. We're going to trust. Now, when you look at, isn't it interesting, out of, out, of, out of 200 plus verses that talk about faith, it's interesting how faith is described. It's never just in a one-dimensional definition. It's always in, in terms like this. This is, what, this is what scriptures say about faith, that there's people that have little faith. Well, why does he even make that point? Why does he just give blanket statements? Because there are people, according to Jesus, that have little faith. Then there's people that have strong faith, and there's people that have weak faith, and there's people, you know, that Jesus saw their faith. So it's observable. There's, there's a tangibility to where you can go, I can tell that person or those people have faith. Jesus questioned people's faith. Jesus rebuked a lack of faith. Ooh. Scripture says, stand firm in the faith. Be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Isn't it something when you get around with somebody that has faith, isn't it interesting that when you walk away, you feel better? When you're around somebody, I mean, they believe God. They trust God. I'm not talking rhetoric, but, but their, their mouth matches their heart, and what comes out is an abiding faith. And you know, they know God. They trust God. They believe God. And you know what? I'm going to hitch up to that wagon right there. I'm going to coattail on it. I want that. I want other people. I want my faith to encourage other people. Satan has demanded that he might sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you, your faith may not fail. And notice this statement. This is a statement of faith. And when you have returned again, strengthen your brothers. Not if you return, when you've returned. So when you go through your little crises, Peter, when you've returned, strengthen your brothers. And there would be a lot of crises. A lot of them would be, would be some pride and some arrogance. And they would go through the whole who's the greatest type thing. And Jesus is saying... Mm, Satan has desired to sift you, demanded to sift you like wheat. Now, here's the picture. Once again, these guys, in that term, fishermen knew what fishermen did. People knew what fishermen did. Uh, agriculture people, they knew what, you know, they knew what people did. So as soon as Jesus said, sift you like wheat, bam, they all get the picture. Oh, here's, the, here's the picture. This is some of the things that are used. Okay, this is great. You take, you take wheat, you put it on the concrete ground, and then you take these giant nunchucks. <laughs> There's no other way to describe it. You beat the snot out of the wheat. That's all you do. You just repeatedly beat it with a flail. It's called a flail. You flail away. You ever heard that? The flailing away. That's what those dudes are doing. I think they're dudes. I'm not quite sure. Um, but they're flailing, man. They are flailing. And so when Jesus said, Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, whoop, there's an image. That's what he wants to do to me? Check. That is what he wants to do to you. <laughs> Give me another picture. Yeah, that's exactly right. Then, there's, then after that, you trample out a little bit. Then you just take a pitchfork and stick it in you and then throw it up in the air. And then the wind is going to blow away the chaff. Why? So that the true seed, the good seed, falls to the ground. That's what you end up harvesting. That's what you end up using. The other stuff gets blown away. And so the picture is, wow, man, I'm going to get stomped on. I'm going to get crushed. I'm going to get broken. I'm going to get sifted. I'm going to get thrown up in the air many times, not just one time. And we're going to call that a spiritual test. That's awesome. Is there another picture? I'm not sure. Yeah, that's what it looks like right there. Just get a bunch of concrete, throw the weed in there, start flailing away, start stomping away. Peter, that's what's going to happen. That's a threshing floor. That's what's going to happen to you. So let me tell all of you this right at the front end. This is what's going to happen to all of you. Hallelujah, Jesus. <laughs> I don't like it either. Okay. You know what? That is what's going to happen. What's the point? The point is that what's left is humility and confidence in God that you've never had before. I will just tell you this as an old guy. When I look back, 
going through the greatest tests produce the greatest faith. Even though I've repeatedly said, I'm glad I went through that, I'd never want to go through that again. Just be honest with you. But what emerges is a greater faith, less of Bob, more of Jesus. It's called the crucified life. It's called self-denial. It's really what he's looking for. Are you saying in some way that Jesus is trying to kill me? Yeah, that's pretty much it right there. Your flesh, you. Get the flesh out. So it's just Jesus. When they see you, they see Jesus. They don't see all your accomplishments. They see Jesus they, because they know you. And there must be a God. <laughs> if he did that through you, there's a God because I know you. You're not even capable of that. That's the point. He gets the glory. Hebrews 11, verse 23. A couple verses here about Moses. Can I have a sip of coffee? Is that your gum on top? Yeah. <laughs> My wife would say something about that. <clears throat> Hebrews 11, get down to Moses, verse 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. <laughs> they saw that he was no ordinary child. Now, isn't that what every parent says about their kids? <laughs> oh, he's no ordinary child. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> no, every parent. Oh, <laughs> This is the dilemma of being a pastor. That when they show you the baby, they go, what do you think? Wow. Isn't he beautiful? Wow. Not really what I was thinking, but it's a baby. They saw he was no ordinary child. It's more than just physical attributes here that he's talking about. There was something that marked him with distinction. In fact, in Acts 7, Stephen would recall these stories, and he would say that Moses was a beautiful child. Who, what guy describes a child as a beautiful child? It means he was marked. There was some destiny, some distinction. This is going to be the deliverer. This is a big deal. But notice that the faith of Moses ultimately to lead a few million people in the Exodus and out of bondage doesn't start with Moses. It starts with his parents. I want to, let me just ask you this. How many of you were raised in a Christian home? Can I see your hands? Can I see your... Okay, here's what I want to tell you. When was the last time one person went, ah, kind of not. <laughs> you know, Monday, Wednesday, Sunday? Yeah, the rest of the time? Nah, not so much. How many again? You were raised in a Christian home. When was the last time you thanked your parents if they're still alive? There's your homework. Homework is call them. Say, Mom, Dad, I know you weren't perfect, but you trusted God, and I'm sure you prayed a few thousand prayers for me, and I'm sure a few of them got through. Be grateful. Because I'll tell you, I know what it's like to be raised in a non-Christian home and all the garbage that goes with that. And I know people that, you know, weren't raised. They were the first, I'm the first person in my family that came to faith. It's messy, man. And so if you came from a godly home, boo, praise God and thank your parents. And so this is, you know, this is... Moses' parents hit him. They weren't afraid of the king's edict. Now, it's interesting because that sounds like a little contradiction. They weren't afraid, but yet they, they have a couple options. Here's their options. Option one is we stay because, you know, the Pharaoh said, basically, we're going to kill all the firstborn because there's too many of them running around. They're going to overtake us one day. So we're going to kill all the firstborn. Okay, so option A. Imagine this, parents. Option A is... We stay here, and when they go house to house, they find him and they kill him. Option B, let's make a little basket and put him in a river. <laughs> That's your options. Are you kidding me? That's your options. Hey, I think we need to pray about this. A, we just hope the king doesn't see him or hear him, even though our baby's extraordinary and probably doesn't cry, but he's going to be looking. Or B, let's make a basket and put him in a river and trust God that he's going to be totally okay. That's intense. So here's the point about faith. Faith is risky no matter what. It's a risk. Now, once again, 
having faith and not being afraid of the king or the pharaoh doesn't mean that you don't use wisdom and prudence. Okay, they're, they're, they're not opposed to each other. Faith walks in concert with wisdom. You know, there were times when Jesus walked through a crowd because they were after him, and there's other times where Jesus actually ran. Why? I don't know. We'll study that some other time. But I mean, it's all risky. Now, here's what I notice about faith, and this is what I notice as I peruse through the gospel. Isn't it interesting, you never see Jesus shut down anybody because they're believing for too much. Just think about this for a minute. Wander through the Gospels and look at all the stories, and you never, you never see Jesus say, you know, you're getting carried away with that faith stuff. You need to dial it back just a bit. You don't see that. You don't see that. No, what you see is him paying great attention to people, not if they falter, but when they falter, and then saying something about it. And once again, you go to, you know, you go to, you go to Peter, you know, they're on a boat, and Peter just, once again, has one of those faith moments, like, hey, if it's you, call me to walk out on the water, which is crazy. It's audacious. It's got faith attached to it. Jesus said, yep, come on out. Peter comes out, which I think is remarkable. It's an amazing thing. He starts to sink. Jesus grabs him. He's, Lord, save me. Shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, save me. Grabs Pete, gets him back in the boat. And you know what Jesus says? Why'd you doubt? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I just walked on water. Remember that? I walked on water, got a little panicky, started to sink. And Jesus, why'd you doubt? Is that it's kind of remarkable, isn't it? No attaboys. You know what's interesting when you go back to the first verse when he says, Satan has de demanded to sift you like wheat, and I'll pray that your faith doesn't fail. You know what's interesting is Jesus doesn't coddle him in that moment. Jesus doesn't fix him in that moment. Because there's something about stature there. What he's doing is he's increasing stature in Peter. It's not, and there's no Band-Aid here. It's almost like, man, it's like a dad leaving his kid on the high dive for the first time. It's like, yeah, you got this. It's kind of interesting. So once again, you look, at, you, you look at how Jesus responds to certain things. And he's never opposed to people that dare great things for God. You just don't see that. You see four guys rip through a roof at a Bible study with some religious mucky mucks. I'm talking high-octane Pharisee people, man. And guys are ripping through a guy's roof to lower a guy in. What does Jesus say? He says Jesus saw their faith. They're ripping a roof open. It's kind of a big deal. I mean, they're breaking in. They're breaking the law, maybe. He saw their faith. Isn't that just kind of crazy? I mean, you go down and down, and, then, and the disciples in the boat, storm comes up. They freak out. Don't you care we're perishing? Once again, Jesus doesn't coddle them and say, I really care, guys. Come on. I do. I care. We're having a moment here. I care. Yeah, I do. He goes, no, what are you afraid of? And why do you have so much unbelief? I don't know. I've been in a boat that I thought was going down. That's a little scary. But Jesus doesn't, you know, it's easy. He doesn't give a little hug. He just says, you know, why, why the unbelief? I don't get it. So, Here's my point here. You know you've been sifted when your prayers have reduced God to a manageable deity in the wrong way. I'm talking about the wrong way. This is how you know you've been sifted and he didn't respond well to the deal. That our prayer life is really small and manageable. In fact, let me just throw this on you here because I think about this stuff. This stuff kind of gets in me and kind of like works me over a little bit. Does your prayer life, if, if, if I asked you to write down 10 things that you're believing God for right now, would they be big things? Or would they be things that you can manage on your own? Would they, would they be any outrageousness to them? I mean, would there be any like really like big substantive things? Because once again, we either have the examples in the Gospels to follow or just to say, that's a great story and let's put it on a flannel board in children's church. I don't even know what a flannel board is, but I think it's where you put a little flannel stuff up there. Back in the old days, before high tech, is that what it was? You saw those, right? I, I never saw those. I missed that era. 
No, so, so I, I would just say, what, what, your faith, what, is, what, what do you believe in God for? Now, right now, you might be just kind of going, I, I don't know, I'm not really believing God for anything. I will say that's not the will of God at all. Believe. I would, you want some more homework? How many of you like homework? <laughs> It'll be over in six minutes. Um, go, go home, write down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you say, what am I really believing God for? Now, if you got nothing, man, I'm telling you, you got to say, God, give me some dreams here. Give me, give me some dreams. I told my wife like two years, eight months ago, I said, you know what bugs me about me right now is I'm, I'm not a visionary. I'm not seeing things that God sees. And, and there's no big things. And I'm like, it's kind of bugging me about myself right now. Because what I'm reading in here is a big God. And what I'm seeing in me is a small dude that's not, he's kicking tires. You know, God, I, I want, give me something. I want to do something. I want, I want to see you as you really are, not just quote the word. I want to see you as you really are. And you know what's interesting? A few years ago, things started to change. And I started like, wow, there are a few things that God wants to do. And I'm just a vessel. And if I'll yield myself to it, you know, I think there's some big things that can be done. I, I don't know all that that looks like, but man, one more verse, a couple more verses right here. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, you know what God's will is for us? Grow up. <laughs> How many of you had parents that said, would you just grow up? They never defined it for you. Grow up, and this is what it means. They just said grow up, and it's like, nah, I'm not sure what that means, but grow up. I love what Moses, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, Refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He severed ties with the royal family. It's over. No, I'm going a different way. I'm going to identify with the people of God. How do you know you're grown up? You make big choices. You make hard choices. You make choices knowing that other people are affected by your choices. It's called maturity. Immaturity says everything is about me, it revolves around me, my wants, my needs, me, 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 me. Mature faith says, my needs are met one way or other, no matter what, it's time to get on and believe God for big things. No man lives to him. It's actually embracing Romans 14 or 15 there, a couple verses. No man lives to himself, no man dies to himself. Rather, he lives or dies, he lives and dies to the Lord. Not my, not my own, bought with a price. There's a verse up here. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and I reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Once again, I can't tell you if you've been a Christian for three years, five years, eight years, you should be mature and not think about yourself. There comes a point, though, when you grasp eternity and the values of the kingdom and the worth of people and the dignity of people, and I don't spend a lot of time on my, on my own stuff. Put away. It's like, God, I need this, I need this, I need this. Stop. Stop. I'm believing for these people. I'm believing for this marriage. I'm believing for this addict. I'm believing for this person that thinks going to church is just fine and they need to be a disciple. They need to really wholly embrace your word and everything that you have for them. That's what I'm believing for. I'm believing for big things. I'm believing for orphanages. I'm believing for homes, you know, in Haiti for single moms. I'm believing for that. Stretch, man. Let's get uncomfortable together. I mean, really, let's just like, oh, I feel awkward. What's the problem? I'm faithless. You know what Jesus said? What, oh, listen to what Jesus said. Oh, my God. Maybe you don't want to be a disciple, okay? Um, Jesus. The guy says, hey, my son is demonic, and he throws himself into the fire. I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't cure him. You know what Jesus said? Faithless and perverted generation. How long am I going to be with you? I mean, basically, that was an eye roll. It's like, really, guys? Oh, my God. Unbelievable. And then Jesus cures the guy, heals him. It's all good. Then the disciples, same ones who said, who's the greatest, come privately and say, why couldn't we cast him out? Because you're doubt and unbelief. That's why. It's a simple deal. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, thought, reasoned like a child. When I grew up, I put away childish things. Every person in Hebrews 11, the notables, all had to leave something behind to embrace the maturity that God had for them. So this faith, man, is about refusing some things, old identities, old privileges, old comforts, old securities, all those things. But, you know, the needs of the world. It chose to be mistreated. 
somehow this guy from Pakistan, um, pastor in Pakistan, finds me through a friend. They tell him about me. You need to meet Bob. They tell me you need to meet Asif. And I say, great. And, you know, all of a sudden, there he is, man. I'm at these people's house up in Washington. Hey, you want to talk to this guy? Yeah, I talked to this guy. We hit it off. Great, man. And let me just show you a picture. So he says, hey, brother, would you, would you speak to my church? I said, sure. So we hook up through the internet, man. What a great age we live in. I preached last Saturday night in Pakistan, and I didn't even leave. <laughs> had my Bible, had my notes, had my dresser, had my phone in the cradle. I'm like, <laughs> preaching up a storm, <laughs> a little bedroom downstairs. And there's, you know, 35, 40 Pakistanis, man. And so we get to talking, about, talking to this guy. We, he texts me. He calls me every other day, you know, and uh, love the guy. But he, he plants churches. He's got, he's got some stuff going on. What do I say? I go, dude, I want to come. He goes, I'll sponsor you. You can come. No problem. And so I said, awesome. So I committed. And I thought, you know, I should probably look up where this place is. And then a proverb came to me. See a man hasty in his words? There's more hope for a fool than him. It's like, oh, God. So I go, I better check out where this guy's at. So I check it out. I YouTube Christians in Lahore, Pakistan. Wow, those bur- buildings are burning. Two years ago, 100 Christian homes burned. A couple churches burned to the ground. I'm like, shoot. Told the guy I'd come. Man. Hate it when that happens. <laughs> and I had to tell my wife, too. It's like, hey, I might go to Pakistan. Isn't that where Osama came from? Yeah, but don't worry about that. It's no big deal. <laughs> told Brandon. What are you leaving behind? You got to leave behind comfort. I was talking to him. I said, where do you minister? He tells me he's a different place. He says, I, I go to this one slum. Super poor. They got nothing. He goes, no, no Christians will go there. I said, how come? He says, because they know when they go there, they don't get anything. You know what I said? I said, I want to go. God, get me to the slum. Get me in there, man. Spray paint. I'll do a spray tan, man. I'll get a turban. And sneak into Pakistan. I don't know, man. My point is, if you want to grow in faith, you've got to leave some things behind. And if we want to grow and mature in faith, there's going to be a sifting. And it's going to be awkward and it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's when you quote the verse, you know, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest for your souls. Okay, yeah, you're still going to get sifted. So let's stand up. point of faith is John 6, when Jesus tells hard truth to disciples, like, if you want to be my disciple and follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And then it says, from that moment, many disciples went away and left him. And Jesus said to the ones that remained, are you leaving also? Once again, Jesus isn't a coddler. He's compassionate, but he's not a coddler. He's not afraid to let you and I sit with the weight of a situation. And he said, you leaving also? And they said, where, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life. That's the point. The point is he has the words of eternal life, and there's nowhere else to go. And if you're raised in the world, I mean, doing crazy in a non-Christian home, there really is nowhere else to go. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have people come forward and pray for you. And I, you know, if, if, you're, if you're here, and I was talking about doing big things for God and all that, and you're sitting here going, I'm just trying to get through. I'm just trying to survive. Man, get somebody to link up with you and pray and ask God to just open your heart and your mind and your imagination about kingdom stuff, kingdom building. And if you're somebody that's really just, you know, you're dragging issues of your past, you know, that's keeping you from growing up. You know, old hurts, old wounds, old blame, old bitterness, old relationships, old people, old those kind of things. There needs to be a severing, and sometimes it takes the faith of another person in the name of Jesus to sever that stuff. So, Father, I pray for every person here, right here, right now. I pray for those that are dreamless 
in the Rock of Roseville. And I pray that you would begin to speak dreams and visions to them, God. Visions and dreams of holiness, visions and dreams of kingdom projects, visions of hope for people, for the afflicted, for the wounded, for the oppressed, God. Stir conversation, Lord. This isn't just to do things just for the sake of doing them. It's, it's, it's about aligning our heart, God. It's about having faith, and faith moves mountains, and it brings healing, and it does great crazy things. And so, God, those of us that are yoked with a very manageable life, a manageable faith, I pray we wreck it, disrupt it, disturb it. God, help us in that sifting process be faithful. Help us be faithful to you, God. And when we've been sifted and shaken and broken and crushed, God, I pray the essence of Jesus Christ himself is left. And so help us, God, in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. So be it. All right.